Dirk Forrestar. Euh, vous êtes euh, président... Oui, vous avez oui, il y a le micro, c'est bon, merci. Vous êtes, uh, I will ask the question in English afterwards, of, of course. Vous êtes président uh, d'International Emission Trading Association. C'est une organisation à but non lucratif. Elle a été créée pour um, euh, établir un cadre pour l'échange dans le domaine des réductions de gaz à effet de serre. Et euh, ce marché, ce qu'on appelle le marché des émissions carbone, est de votre point de vue un outil particulièrement, euh, particulièrement innovant. Pardon. Alors j'ai envie de vous demander évidemment pourquoi il est innovant et comment il a été mis en place à partir de quel constat. So what is, what is emission trading first of all and on which pollutant was it first created And um, why is it considered to be an, an innovative tool? Emissions trading um, came along really strong, I guess, in the early 1990s, and it was a true innovation in environmental policy. Um, it doesn't work on every pollution problem, but for problems where there are many sources of emissions, and the problem involves the loading of those emissions in the atmosphere over time, it's a really good tool. I think it was first uh, used in a, in a major way in the U.S. acid rain program, which was proposed by President George H.W. Bush, which was um, the more recent George Bush's father. Uh, so it was a Republican idea that uh, Democrats in Washington went along with uh, because it got more reductions faster than the old approaches. The old approaches to environmental controls in, in many countries, uh, and I think this would be true in France and in the US, uh, involved requirements of uh, use of particular technologies. So government bureaucrats decided what was the best technology to apply for a given pollution problem. They would tell you what to do, when to do, and how to do it. And uh, it was, uh, the company had no flexibility at all. Whereas with emissions trading, what happens is the, the overall number of sources are each given limits, but collectively they have to reduce the, the overall amount. And specifically how it gets distributed amongst companies doesn't really matter. Um, one company may do way more than its share and another do less because of the cost involved. But collectively they achieve their goal. So that's why I think it was seen as an innovation is it pushed the decision making out to business so that business professionals made the decisions about what technology was right for them in a particular uh, instance. And uh, it allowed them to uh, innovate because the uh, new technologies could come in and not have to wait for a government approval to be used. Uh, so it really created a race for technologies to, to come along that would be better. So um, economists and uh, politicians alike looked at that acid rain example and thought, wow, that's a, that's a real breakthrough. That's a different thing. Um, a few years later, it was applied to carbon dioxide for the first time in the Kyoto Protocol. So the Kyoto Protocol has that emissions trading structure to it, but it really came to life first in voluntary markets and later in the EU ETS, uh, which is now the prime example in the world, but not the only one, but the best example of a big emissions trading program. Ok, je, juste, je voulais être sûr euh, qu'il n'y avait pas d'autres personnes qui avaient besoin de casque de traduction. On peut faire une courte pause pour que vous puissiez en récupérer un si vous ne l'avez pas récupéré tout à l'heure. Non, tout est ok pour tout le monde. On peut continuer. Alors, je, euh, évidemment, je vais vous demander si, si, si ça marche ce système-là parce qu'il a été effectivement pensé euh, en théorie, euh, comme vous l'avez dit, avec un système d'équilibre entre ceux qui ont finalement euh, le, le, euh, qui peuvent réduire concrètement leurs émissions à leur niveau et puis ceux qui ne peuvent pas le faire et qui, pour le coup, euh, vont bénéficier. Enfin, c'est un système collectif de, de, de mutualisation finalement. Euh, mais ça marche. On le disait tout à l'heure, si le prix du carbone est suffisamment incitatif, c'est quoi votre point de vue là-dessus how, how does it work concre concretely And, and um, we talked about the price of uh, carbon. Um, and we know now that uh, if it's um, too low, it's not, uh, um, it doesn't work anymore. So what's your point of view, point of view on this Well, um, first of all, as to how it works, I guess at its simplest uh, uh, 
core structure, you can imagine two companies that are each given an emission reduction obligation. One does more than enough and is able to sell that to the other one so that together they achieve the target. Um, what that really means is that one of them is making money because he's selling reductions, but the other one is saving money. So it is the classic win-win because it works for both of them and it works for the environment. And I think that's why environmental organizations have, have uh, grown to like the solution is that it caps emissions, so it really does get the emission reduction. Um, the way that it's played out uh, recently in Europe is that when the economic crisis hit, industrial production went down, power production went down, use of fossil fuels went down, and the carbon price went down. Any economist would say that the carbon price did exactly what it was supposed to do. And if it hadn't gone down, people would have said, something's wrong, it's a fake market. But the price did adjust, and for many industrial um, uh, companies throughout Europe, they saw that as a very good thing because they were suffering economically and the carbon price adjusted along with fuels. What it, um, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is that throughout all of the turmoil uh, driven by the economic crisis, the ETS met its environmental objective every year and still does. So it's meeting the environmental target. What is it not doing? It's not sending a long-term pricing signal that is really commensurate with what two degrees means. So that's why there are reforms under discussion in, um, in the EU ETS about creating a stabilizing reserve, a market stability reserve that could sort of take the oversupply out of the market and bring it back when times are short. Uh, but also, it's why it's so important to get long-term targets set. So Europe has proposed a 2030 target of a 40% reduction. For the ETS sectors, it's more than that. It's 43%. Um, but there's also discussion about whether that's actually enough. Is that actually on the right trajectory? And I have a feeling you would have an answer to that. Um, my members would like to know what the long-term trajectory is for Europe, but we know that in in the uh, 2050 time frame, Europe is interested in a reduction on the order of 80 to 95%. So the 40% leads to the lower end of that range, or the, the easier end of 80%. So that's the trajectory Europe has proposed so far, the, the European Commission, and, and is currently in decision-making process. But I think once uh, the market sees clarity about what the longer-term targets are, Pricing is going to respond, uh, but it's really looking for that clarity. Uh, une autre question, uh, Dirk Forrester. Uh, ce marché dont vous parlez, pour qu'on comprenne bien, uh, c'est un, uh, un, un marché... Uh, alors, j'essaie de bien le formuler, mais on va dire que c'est un marché d'émissions carbone euh, obligatoire qui va concerner euh, des secteurs particuliers qui sont particulièrement émetteurs, euh, mais ça ne concerne pas tout le monde, ça ne concerne pas toutes les entreprises, ça va concerner le secteur euh, de, 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 de l'acier, du verre, du papier, de l'électricité. Euh, mais qu'est-ce qu'on dit à aux autres entreprises. What about um, other enterprises? Not uh, the one who are um, identify like the more uh, pollute more, but uh, the other one. How can they um, deal with that? How can they um, go into this market? Uh, it is the principle of uh, compensation. Is that right? La compensation, c'est le principe de la compensation. Tout le monde peut finalement bénéficier de ce marché, aller sur ce marché. Everybody can go there. Well, I think, yeah, emission markets have something to offer both for heavy industries that are typically covered by laws, but also by companies that want to be responsible, that want to do what's uh, more than what's required by law and actually demonstrate leadership and, uh, and influence their full carbon footprint. And I think we have an example of that in the place we're sitting today, uh, but you're not alone. Uh, there are many companies that uh, do not have emission obligations who first look at what their footprint is, and uh, this is what uh, companies like Echoac can help you do, figure out what your footprint is. 
figure out what some of the best things you could do to reduce emissions on site would be. And then if, there's, if it gets too expensive, you look externally at things that you could do through carbon offsetting. And um, many major companies are beginning to do that, and they're also forcing their suppliers to look at it. I know that um, I've, I've uh, been in China and heard Chinese companies talk about Walmart's requirements for how they're going to clean up their footprint and they want to uh, and clean up their supply chain. So they want to uh, uh, be responsive to that customer uh, interest. Uh, so I think it's actually a very valid tool for companies that are uh, in other areas other than the really heavy emitting sectors. So they can draw lessons out of what works in carbon markets. They can utilize the same tools, use the same measurement and verification systems, and have confidence that what they're doing is making a difference. Okay, thank you very much.